My name is Raj Desai, I'm the Executive Director at Thai. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is going to be a great event. I uh, hope you all enjoyed the dinner and wine. Uh, unfortunately, we can't take any beverages or food into this hall, so I appreciate your cooperation on that. Um, so uh, this is going to be, as I said, a very interesting panel discussion. And uh, do uh, you know uh, stick around for Q&As, any aspect of it that may not be answered through the discussion uh, that is, uh, our friends uh, on the panel are going to talk about. Um, I really want to thank uh, KPMG and uh, Qualcomm for this partnership uh, to bring this uh, subject uh, and the discussion uh, to our membership. With that, I'd like to introduce our president, Magdash Shukla, to uh, say a few things um, and uh, introduce our moderator for the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Raj. So, uh, you know, before I go further, I'd like to kind of uh, invite you to our host for the evening here, Rajiv Thadani, partner from KPMG, uh, to say a few words. So I'm no machine expert, I'm no IT expert, I do international tax. So I'm clearly a misfit in this room, right? But I just wanted to say, uh, I want to thank Thai for the opportunity to host. I know conference rooms go at a premium these days. Actually, where's Yogi? Any kind of real estate goes at a premium these days, right? <laughs> so we're glad to get this room. It, it's pretty packed most of the week. So we're glad. I think this is our second event in a couple of weeks. So yeah. we've been fortunate to get get the room. Uh, I couldn't. I was discussing with Raj earlier. Uh, the the title is pretty intriguing. Like I said, I'm not an IT guy. I'm an international tax guy. I do different kind of IT. I do international tax. Uh, but I couldn't help but notice the the uh, the the title of today is uh, can machines think like what if machines think like men and I think I, I'm gonna venture humans think uh, sorry I stand corrected humans not men uh, yeah. that's great and and I couldn't and I and I'm gonna venture a guess that almost everyone saw the match last night with uh, India versus Bangladesh. And you, you probably know about the big controversy about Rohit Sharma, whether he was out or not. And you think that that's where machine could have, you know, overridden <laughs> what, in that case, it was a man and a human being. So, so, so I, it's an intriguing topic. And I think, you know, for anyone that's watching the World Cup, which I know is, we're all passionate about, it's a religion for us. I'm just blown away by the amount of data that comes up on the screen, right? Uh, all the stats that they present, and I think that's, if you compare this to the to the last World Cup, there wasn't half of these stats that were available, and I think it's great that they're now able to keep track of this, and it's not in someone's head, it's in a, it's in a machine that is being shared. So I look forward to the discussion, and again, thank you for uh, being at KPMG. Thanks, Rajiv. So folks, this is kind of event, you see, we, you know, we hope to put uh, throughout the year. In fact, uh, with Tycon coming, uh, I, I don't know, uh, how many of you get uh, emails from Thai? I guess all of you, right? Okay, that's why you are here. Okay. <laughs> and today, I think the email went out to see about the IoT track at, uh, at Tycon. We have a you know, great, great lineup of speakers. Uh, there are two other tracks on Friday. One is, uh, one is on cloud infrastructure and security, and the third one is on data economy how data is uh, collected, how it's managed, how it's analyzed, and what the implication for it is insights. So, so one of the things I want to tell you is that uh, if you are working for a company and you want to attend this conference, uh, pretty soon there will, be a, there will be some information on the website that you could use to persuade your company to uh, treat it as work day for you and actually reimburse you for, for uh, you know, for the time, you know, for the registration fee and all those things. So, uh, watch out for that. I think uh, in, in in a couple of weeks, you see, we'll have that, uh, you know, on, on the website, and take advantage of that. Spread the word. Uh, so, without further ado, see, I want to kind of kick off this thing. Uh, I, uh, let me invite to see the moderator. Uh, moderator of the evening is uh, Jim McGregor. 
and he is with uh, uh, Tirias Research and uh, premier market research uh, company in semiconductor and, and systems. And we had uh, a, another event to see last year, uh, which was uh, also a, a packed event and a very, very successful event. And Jim, you see, had moderated that also. So he has a good track record of moderating Thai events. So with that confidence, you see, let me hand it over to him, and he'll introduce the rest of the panelists. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much. Either they keep inviting me back because I'm actually doing a good job, or just the fact that I'm the only one they could get to do it. But um, I'm very happy to be here, and thanks again to KPMG for hosting this. Um, obviously, last year we did IoT, which was a hot topic, and this year kind of extends that topic even more, talking about machine learning. Uh, this is a very important topic, because this is really what can we do with all that data that we're generating, and how is it going to change the world that we live in? So I'm glad to be here with uh, Qualcomm. So just kind of a, a little introduction. Uh, we're going to have a brief presentation on it from Qualcomm, and then we're going to have some demos, and then we're going to invite the rest of the panel up, and I'll introduce them as we come up. Um, and then we're going to have an inter interactive discussion for about an hour. I'm going to moderate kind of the first part of it, but after that, we definitely want to get the audience involved. So as you're thinking, when you're watching the presentation and anything else, think about your questions, because that's really the value of this venue, is, is getting the audience participation and getting your questions answered. So with, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, uh, Magid Zaki. He is the uh, Director of Technical Marketing for Qualcomm. Thank you, Thank you Jeff. I don't know if everyone can hear me OK. Or Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. So I think Jem made my job really easy because he said I won't answer any questions. I will just propose some questions for you to basically ask during the panel. Uh, so what we're going to share with you today is some of our views around cognitive technologies and if really machines can think like human and what Qualcomm actually envisioned regarding that and what we are doing in this area and planning to do also in the future. And for us actually, we started to think about what can make that happen. So I'm going to start actually with a quick video. <clears throat> they perceive, reason, and act intuitively. So I'll restart the video again. Imagine a world where devices, machines, and other things are more intuitive. They perceive, reason, and act intuitively simplifying and enriching our daily lives. To make this a reality, Qualcomm is bringing cognitive technologies to life. Expanded human abilities. Cognitive technologies serve as natural extensions of our senses by seeing, hearing, and understanding their surroundings. When technology can help you see the world in a different light, comprehend an unfamiliar place, or show you things you didn't know were there, you experience life in new ways. The way we think about cognitive technologies and how it's impacting everything, now you hear about IoT and many devices and machines around us. So we think there are some fundamental capabilities that we need to add to, add to devices and machines to allow them to be more intelligent and act almost like us, like human beings. And one of the key things that we do as human is we are able to perceive what's happening around us. And by ability even to see things, we actually use 70% of our brain horsepower to do that. So that requires a lot of processing. Because it's not just by capturing these pictures, it's more about understanding the scene you are looking at. So we are trying to add these capabilities to the devices and machine. We're doing that on the seeing part, but also hearing. If can devices can hear also like human being and understand what's being said. And also by adding many sensors in the smartphone. So every smartphone now has a close to a dozen sensors depending on that smartphone you are having today. So now this machine and devices can also monitor and observe what's happening around them. So th this idea of perception, what the industry actually has been working on for some time now is all the deep learning and computer vision, and also Qualcomm is doing things in this area that we're gonna share with you today. And then beyond that is also the understanding. Once, once you get this information, how you reason about it, how you infer the context, 
learn the information and anticipate what the user need to do. And that would also require more machine learning and processing to happen in these devices and machines. And based on that, you can act in it. And when we think about these things, we think about the useful application that can be used for that. So if you think about your smartphone today, for instance, and what it can do for you, so think about a simple thing like camera. You're trying to capture some pictures. And if this kind of intelligence is embedded in the smartphone, what it can do for you? So if your camera phone now can recognize what scene you're looking at, if it's a beach scene or a football or soccer game that you just watched, or maybe uh, if, if it's a birthday party. So the camera, if it's able to exactly recognize what it's looking at, it would be able, based on that, to say this is a beach scene or a football game. And if it's a football game, it can adjust the shutter speed and how fast it takes the picture and all these things and take the picture that you really want to do. So that's on one level. But also that applies to things like robotics, how, when robots can actually see and hear things around them and have this intelligence and perception, what it can enable for us. So we see this capabilities actually will be very important for devices and things. And we bring so many benefits. So why should we care about that? Because actually that's basically expanding what we can do as humans. So you hear all the discussions about how machines are going to replace us and we get into the singularity issues. But actually, also machines are helping, or machines are helping us. So it's helping the visually impaired. It can help us do things easier and expand our human ability. So it serves as this natural extension of our senses. And there is all the aspect of contextual personalization, how you can personalize the smartphone, how the thermostat will be adjusting the temperature based on you know, understanding what you do every day. So there are limitless applications for that. But it's a very hard task to add this perception and reasoning and actually be able to have this intuitive action on devices and machine without also annoying user, which is a big challenge. So actually at Qualcomm, we have been thinking about that. And if you think about Qualcomm and where we sit, and we are working on smartphones, and now smartphone is doing many things. It's replacing the camera, it's replacing, it has audio technologies, it has connectivity, it has so many technologies that when you think applying the intelligence and machine learning to these technologies, it can really change the game there. And that's why when we think about these cognitive technologies, we definitely think about machine learning. And deep learning has been gaining traction, and that's something that we are working on. But also we think about different machine learning algorithms that apply to different problems, and how basically not one solution would fit all, and apply that to every aspect of the technologies that we have. So if you think about computer vision and making devices really see and hear in 3D, so you can apply these technologies to, by capturing the pictures in 3D, which we can do today with the studio, the stereo cameras or other dips cameras. But once you capture, capture these pictures, there is lots of compute happening to model the environment around you. And also lots of actual processing happening to understand what you are looking at with deep learning. And you apply that to another big pillar, which is always on sensing and always on awareness. And now by having, again, a dozen of sensors in your smartphone, you have in your car so many sensors in all devices now. In robotics, you have lots of sensors. How can you do this sensor processing in ultra low power and apply the appropriate machine learning algorithm to these things? So if you want to enable really this 24-7, always on aware devices, what that requires in terms of low power processing and what kind of machine learning algorithm you would need for that. If you think about multimedia, multimedia is a big thing for the smartphone and infotainments in the car and other aspects. Also, that's an interesting thing. So think about also having just the audio coming from your tablet or smartphone and you are playing the game. So now all this technology gives you the 3D audio or 3D surround system that you feel really the immersive experience. And as you get excited and you start to move the tablets and as you are playing the game, there are technologies now that will be able actually to adapt to, to see what you're doing exactly and adapt them to the movement of your head. And based on that, I adjust this sphere of surround system around you. And that's, again, how we, when we introduce the intelligence to multimedia, that will impact this. Apply that to connectivity. Apply that also to security. I think security here is a big issue because people get concerned. As, you, as these devices really become smart, knows more about you than your family members, what's going to happen? And that's something really can be scary and something that we are taking seriously at Qualcomm. So for that, actually, you would think about all this 
machine learning and intelligence can hurt our privacy and security, but can also it, it can be also used to enhance the security. So what basically the vision we have is to enable all these benefits of this vision, the expanded human abilities, the contextual personalization, having these human-like interactions with devices and deal with them in a natural way, but without compromising the security and privacy. And that's something that you may not know about Qualcomm, but think about your smartphones. Billions of smartphone, smartphones actually powered by our security solutions today. And there are different components of how we see this security would be solved and evolved in this context. So one thing which we firmly believe in is how basically doing things on hardware, on smartphone for instance, would be very important. And doing things on device. So think about this scenario, always on sensing and always on listening to what you're doing, whether your TV is always on, always listening to what you are saying at home, or your smartphone now is able to actually pick upon what you are saying. And if you think about all this information uploaded to the cloud, people get really nervous. I don't wanna everyone on the planet hear what I'm saying at home. But actually doing things on device and giving basically our customers and the customers of our customers to do things on device, that's a very, actually, uh, a very good option for people to keep their privacy and things on device. Also, People have been thinking about authentication for a long time, and now we see basically the struggle we have with the password. So I don't know how many passwords you have for many services, and how digits you need, and how you keep forgetting passwords. So one of, part of this version we see for smartphones, but also to other devices, how we can enable this seamless authentication. How through using biometrics and behavioral analysis, these devices will be able to authenticate you in a secure way, but also in a convenient way. And that's something very important. So we just announced actually a product which is called Qualcomm Sense ID 3D fingerprint, 3D fingerprint. And that's basically a very secure fingerprint authentication method that has many benefits other than other technologies like capacitive, for instance. So that's basically one thing that we started to do in terms of how we use biometric and we're taking that to the next level. The uncompromised privacy also about doing things on hardware, keeping all the key for authentication on hardware, keeping your fingerprint information. Because think about when we enable now fingerprint and someone in it basically steal your fingerprint, how could you authenticate yourself? So all this information, how it's stored on device and encrypted, that's something that we also care about. And finally, basically the preemptive protection with all the malware attack and things that are happening, how we are adapting to that by using behavioral analysis, basically to deal with these issues. So now we are using some machine learning or behavioral analysis techniques, not actually to compromise your privacy or the user privacy, but to enhance the security and privacy of things. And we're gonna, I guess, discuss that a little bit more during the panel. And that's why we think developing these technologies that we talked about, like machine learning and computer vision, even if it's very compute intensive, we think there is a big value of doing things on device. And one of the benefits is security and privacy, that what we mentioned, but also the immediate response. So think about applying machine learning and computer vision in a car scenario. And you are now you are trying to avoid collisions. And then there is a moose crossing the road, and now the car has to make a decision, like see the moose, recognize him, and then basically stop the car. In these scenarios, you don't want actually to send all the information to the cloud and wait, basically do the processing there and wait for the answer, but you want to have the decision made locally. So there are some use cases and scenarios where you need the on-device processing. With always-on sensing that 24-7, basically collecting data from sensors, you want to also process this data locally because it's not going to be the good use of network bandwidth to send everything to the cloud to process it. So there are these benefits of reliability and security that we enable them. However, supporting this on device, and especially on a smartphone, is not an easy task. Because basically, these capabilities that we're trying to introduce, they have very different characteristics. So machine learning, for instance, it could be compute intensive. It requires a specific type of compute versus processing low, sensor, low power sensor data which is require more real time, more signal processing capability would require another kind of compute. And that's why we end the smartphone to do things in the power 
envelope of the tablet or a smartphone, we need basically to have different kinds of engines, not only CPU, but GPU and ESP and dedicated engines that really excel in doing these things. And we actually, as we are developing this technologies for a smartphone, we are taking that also to adjacent markets. And what help us that there is, we have the scale of billions of devices of a smartphone that we actually introduce our technology there. Your smartphone, if it's older than two years, it becomes really old. So always you change your smartphone, meaning the newer technology always adapted in the smartphone. And then you deal with hard issues when it comes especially to power consumption and these smartphones. And that basically would allow us to take these technologies and put it, take it to other verticals, applying that to automotive, for instance. And how you could, the algorithms that you developed for basically for computer vision and machine learning on the smartphone, how we could adapt that for collision avoidance for the car, or robotics, or drones, or other things. So basically, taking these technologies to the verticals would create new opportunities. For robotics, using the basically efficient and more affordable technology that comes from the smartphone, applying that to robotics, it really changed the game there. Or applying some of the technology we are, de we are developing for autonomous cars or 3D printing, also would it change the game there. So these are, at least I just wanted to do a quick introduction. I don't want to be actually delaying the, the discussions of the panel. But this is where we stand in terms of our views. And we started to develop different components of this vision. And you're going to actually follow us in the next few months. We're going to make more announcements as we go in how we are executing this vision. But today, just to show you some stuff that we have developed, we will show you actually a demo. But basically, that Samir will introduce to us. And it was actually also uh, presented in Mobile World Congress. So Samir Kumar, actually, is Senior Director of our Business Development and Product Management in Qualcomm Research, is going to do the demo for us. Oh, hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, excellent. All right, so we'll go ahead and switch inputs, and I'm going to ask Maga to be my uh, demo assistant. So we're going to show you two things. Um, so as you saw, Maga talk about visual perception. So I'm going to show you a demonstration of on-device deep neural networks being used to classify, let's say, what the camera, right now it's on my tablet, but it could very well be on a drone, it could be in a car, uh, any kind of device. And being able to now start to understand what the camera is looking at, and that being somewhat closer to how you and I would perceive the world when we look at uh, the real world. So let's go ahead, oh, sorry, it's this little one here. Okay, so the screen is up. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn the camera on the device on. And so there's two things I want you to see. You will see what the camera thinks it's seeing, and you'll see also how fast we can actually do this on a Snapdragon-powered device. So let's turn the camera on. OK, thinks it's food. Next. Thought we had flowers. Oh, move back. Uh, there we go. There we go. Okay, next. Okay, keep going. Next. Yep, next. Okay, and of course, no demonstration would be complete without looking at cats. So there you go. Now your camera can recognize cats. Um, and let's just do one more, and then I want to show something else. So there you go. It's seeing trees, skies, cars, outdoor. So what does this all mean? Well, now if I'm able to understand what the visual scene is, I can maybe help someone take a better picture. I could figure out what is the right way to set the camera to capture that particular scene. And so one very trivial example is, well, more and more people, for whatever reason, decide to take pictures of their food. And it's, 
it's known that if you set the camera to high contrast, high color saturation, the food pictures pop. So you could very easily do that. You don't have to mess with Instagram filters or figuring out the right filter. You just point the camera at food and it figures out it's looking at food and it will uh, set those settings to make the food pop. So that's a very simple example, but you can imagine extrapolating from this. The more sophisticated this gets, I can do uh, other things like setting the camera 3A, the um, auto white balance, the, the flash, and other settings that sometimes people don't bother with when they're trying to capture a picture. And as Magad alluded to, well, what if I'm taking a picture of a football match or a cricket match? I can automatically set the camera in terms of the ISO and the shutter speed to try to capture that moment when I want to see the person hitting the bat or hitting the ball. So, and just to show that this is not just you know, working on uh, you know, pre-canned pictures, can you uh, show us your watch for a second? There, hands, watch on wrist. I'll just point it at Magad and it says <laughs> indoor. <laughs> and person, <laughs> and you could go outside and it would say trees and plants and beaches. So another thing we want to think about is, well now, I'm sure if I ask any of you, how many pictures do you have on your phone? And I would bet that most of you, even if you're not you know, uh, regular photographers, have probably amassed a few hundred, if not a few thousand pictures on your device. And the question is, when somebody that you want to show a picture to, and you want to say, yeah, remember that time we were there in that park in that picture? How do you find that picture? Well, typically what you have as an option is your GPS location and when you took the picture. And then you can choose to go browse and see if you can find that picture that you're looking for. But now if the camera is understanding what it's looking at, well, all of my pictures are also now organized based on what the camera recognized as a concept when the picture was captured. So for example, if I want to go ahead and say, well, I was on vacation and I was looking at beach pictures. Okay, so here's all of my beach pictures. But there was also a really pretty cloud pattern that was in the picture. So here's the ones that have clouds in them. But I remember there being a mountain somewhere in the background. That's the picture I'm looking for. So I can very quickly and easily, out of thousands of pictures, get to the exact one that I want to find. Can you explain how you're doing that? So what you saw in the previous example when I was doing the live view, the neural network that's running on Snapdragon is able to classify that it's seeing a beach or a mountain or a car or a person or an airplane. And the way that works, as maybe some of you have been following uh, what's going on with deep learning, you're able to take neural networks and without programming anything, just feed them data or show them lots of examples of things you want them to learn. Whether that's pictures, whether that's something like speech or language, they learn by example, the way human beings do. So you can show a neural network lots of examples of what a beach looks like, what an airplane or a car, and then you can point it at versions of those things it's never seen before. And they happen to do an extremely good job. And that software runs on the mobile device, not in the cloud? The, the trained network, so we've taken a network, we've shown it lots of examples, it's been trained, now we can take that trained network and we can put that on device, and that can now see and look at things it's not seen before, and say, well, I've seen beaches before, this looks like a beach. I've seen airplanes before, this looks like an airplane. Is that the software or the neural chips? So, at the moment, we're talking about Snapdragon hardware and exploiting the existing hardware. But you can imagine over time, as we want to make the algorithms more sophisticated, we want to do video, uh, we want to do language, we want to do always-on types of scenarios. Then you start to make the case for specialized hardware uh, because of power or the kind of processing that you're doing. Okay, so that was one example, and this is an example of something that we actually plan to commercialize with our device maker customers. So this is a user inter interface in terms of a demonstration, but the core technology, which is the neural net, and the runtime, as well as the models for doing visual scene classification, we plan to make those available uh, to our device maker customers. Yeah. A classic example is wine tasting. Imagine you're a food to your wine. Does your uh, laptop do that? Okay. <laughs> I, I remember this a long time ago. Did you develop something like that? Yeah, so wine, let's say, so, I, so are you asking the question, if I want to recognize different types of wine. My French food and uh, different wines, I have a class yeah. list, and so I should be able to spell. Yeah. Hey, you, 
<laughs> right, so I could imagine that being possible, and of course, there are wine apps that you can download for your phone, whether they do it in the cloud and some are you know, recognizing the bottle, but what we're trying to show here is more general, like generalized object recognition in the real world. Now, if I specifically wanted to build a solution for wine bottles or types of cars or, I don't know, parts for an elevator, I could do that, uh, and I could use the same approach, but you know, we're trying to say, hey, my camera's looking at the real world and understand what it's seeing. So let me show you another example, and this one is a little bit more subtle, but hopefully um, after you see uh, how this works, uh, it will uh, be an exciting uh, demonstration. Uh, I can actually do it on here. So th this first example, as I said, is something that we are planning to make commercially available uh, with our OEM customers. Now this next example is also uh, using deep learning and uh, doing that on device but it is using a more advanced and more cutting edge form of deep learning. So again, if you're familiar with you know, what the, the current buzz is, it's convolutional neural networks, and yes, that's what we were using for scene detect, but if you think about where we're going, there's another type of network called a recurrent neural network that is extremely well suited for doing things like video and speech and language. Why? Because there's a time component to the data that you're looking at. And it just also happens that those types of neural networks are also the state of the art for recognizing human handwriting. And you may say, well, why is that interesting? I, you know, I've got a Galaxy Note and I've got a stylus that recognizes my handwriting. Or I've got a you know, Evernote and it does OCR and it can recognize things like business cards. So what's so interesting about doing handwriting recognition uh, with deep learning? Well, think about how we all write. How you make an A versus how I make an A could be very different. And think about all the variations of that throughout the world. And we don't yet have anywhere else that we've seen an example of just using the camera and just looking at the pixels, being able to understand human handwriting. So I don't know how you write, and it's not machine printable text, but I can use OCR, and I can do very accurate handwriting recognition. So let's take a look at that. So this is an example also of we, as in Qualcomm, we're not going to build every single use case. Our goal is to enable things like machine learning and deep learning based approaches to run really fast and well on Snapdragon. And we will do some use cases and then partners will do other use cases. So it depends on what the use case is, who has the data set, and who wants it, but we want you to be able to use Snapdragon to run the solution really well. So here we did a, a partnership with a German company called Planet. Uh, Planet is the provider of, uh, if you've ever wondered when you write an address on a letter and you put it in the post box, how does the, how does the US Postal Service, how do they do such a good job of recognizing all of our handwriting and making sure that the uh, letter gets from point A to point B accurately? This is the same technology running on my Snapdragon tablet versus on a compute cluster in the cloud or on lots of high performance servers. And Planet is the provider of that technology. So we partnered with these guys to say, let's show that you can run your state of the art recurrent nets that are able to accurately recognize human handwriting and show it's possible to do so on a Snapdragon device. So before the meeting started today, I just wrote a few things. So let's just go ahead and do this. Um, Show my camera focuses. So there it is. I just took a picture of that. Let's try another example. And so it's not not everybody writes in block letters. Many people write cursive. Let's see how it does on this one. So it got one error. It didn't get the N. But all, overall, not bad. So is that running on a device that's a handwriting to fully on device text conversion? Right. So we're doing OCR on handwriting versus OCR on machine readable text. And there's no stylus, so there's no prior knowledge of how you made your letters or how you made the stroke. No, no trick. So the, obviously, whether it's 
uh, scenes or handwriting, the neural network has to be trained. And so here, the neural network was trained on seeing lots of examples of what handwriting looks like. And in this case, we're talking about English, but you could do this for any language. And by seeing lots of examples, again, it's able to figure out, here are all the ways people make letters, and here's all the variations in how people make a B or an A or an N. And then it can do a very good job of recognizing examples that it hasn't seen before based on the training data that was provided to it. So this is only like software implemented, uh, hardware implemented, or there is some uh, like API? Yeah, so a good question. So um, as I said, this particular example, um, let me go back to the splash screen here. Uh, this, was, this is Planet's technology for doing handwriting recognition, accelerated and made possible by Qualcomm Xerox, which is the on-device runtime and neural network acceleration technology. So we did this as a partnership, but you can imagine when we want to make this commercially available, that we want other third parties to be able to do what Planet was able to do on top of Xerox. However, that's not something we have today, but you could imagine this is going to be coming in the future. So, so what we is the difference between Planet and... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Are you gonna do the questions later, question and answer session uh, later? Or I'm planning on it, but as long as... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the here keeps coming, I don't know if we're gonna get to it. <laughs> So I guess if you have questions on the demo, I can take that, and other questions maybe we save for the panel. Yeah, I have a question on the difference what Planet is doing versus what you implemented here. Yes. Are they using the same neural net type of, um, what is that, implementations be done on, on servers versus um, Snapdragons, or is it a completely different way of... Good, good, good question. So the question about um, what, let's say, Planet is doing, is it... Is it the same as what they had on servers, or is it a completely different way of doing things? This is the same exact network that Planet has on the server that they have invested many years to create a state-of-the-art handwriting recognition engine, but they struggled with, we can't get this thing to run on a mobile platform because of the types and amounts of compute that's required. And so the help that Qualcomm provides or enables is to figure out how do you take these large neural nets? How do you compactify them? How do you do the compute at each layer efficiently so that you can fit inside of the power and compute budget that you have on a mobile device? So for example, if you look at the scene detection network, that has millions of parameters and has it's a nine layer deep neural net. And so typically, if you ask a deep learning researcher, they would say, yeah, I would run that on a, a GPU and a desktop or server grade GPU. But what we're showing is that it's in fact possible, and not just possible, but you can do it well. You can implement that on a mobile device using the mobile hardware that's available. So are you mapping it differently? Is there a parallel type of architecture that is taking advantage? Yeah, so we, we are doing many things. So underneath it is our heterogeneous computing platform. That includes parallelization, right core for the right task, but also looking at the actual compute. You know, what's happening at each layer? Are you doing Fourier transforms? Are you doing matrix multiplication? And figuring out what is the best way to accomplish that compute at each layer based on the available computing resources. So I, I think we may want to stop the questions at this point and switch over to the panel. Okay. Switch. Can we also get some water up here for the panelists? Yes. Thank you. So, um, just real quick, as we're getting set up and everything, I'll introduce everyone real quick. Obviously, Megat, who's uh, technical marketing for Qualcomm, and Samir, who is uh, senior director for business development, and also wears the hat of product marketing for some of the R&D efforts at uh, Qualcomm, including this deep learning stuff. Um, we also have, I don't know if we're not, do we have the screen going up or not? Okay. We have Aron Sandenhaus, who is also, if you want to stand up for a second, Aron. Um, he's in charge of, he comes from Qualcomm Atheros, and he's also in charge of product management for a lot of the internet of everything efforts and product groups that uh, are at Qualcomm. And we have uh, Kapil uh, Kamra, who is 
uh, director, uh, our uh, product management uh, director and product manager in the uh, Snapdragon group, the processor group or SOC group at Qualcomm in charge of the sensor technology that's going into that. So you have sensors, you've got internet of everything, you've got machine learning or deep learning as, as most people are referring to it today, and you've got technical marketing. So you get, or you've got quite a crew here to answer a lot of your questions. Um, you guys want to come on up real quick? Um, actually, I had a whole list of questions, but my mistake was I gave them to Megan before the presentation, so he basically <laughs> just went through every one of my questions. <laughs> so, uh, so how are those sharks doing? No, just kidding. Um, the, you know, and you guys have some great questions, and I want to get uh, deeper on some of those. Uh, one thing I want to highlight real quick, though, is a lot of times you're going to hear different types of terms being used. You're going to have cognitive learning, you're going to hear artificial intelligence, you're going to hear deep learning, machine learning. All of these really kind of fall under, uh, there's slight differences in them, but they all fall under artificial intelligence. It's all really about taking data and really enabling machines not only to learn, you know, being able to do the speech recognition and image recognition, but even beyond that, how can those machines take action upon that data? And that's really what a lot of this is all about. So. Um, you know, some of your questions were very interesting and they were really targeting, you know, okay, how did you do this? Because everything we're hearing about neural networks are these massive networks and everything else. You know, how are you doing this on a small device? And I, I kind of want to pass this through the panel, um, but I want to talk about two, uh, so can you maybe address two things? First off, what are the key technologies that are required to do this on a mobile device? But also, maybe give them a feel for how that fits into the bigger picture, because Obviously, you talked about that not all of this was done on the mobile device. Some of this learning was done in the cloud. So who wants to kick that one off? You want to start with that, Samir? Oh, sure. So um, that's a good point, which is this is a hybrid architecture. Um, when we say machine learning and we say deep learning, right now the learning part is, in fact, on a high-performance compute cluster or in the cloud. And by learning, what we're talking about is training a neural network so that it starts to be able to classify or be able to accurately describe things that it hasn't seen before, but it's been trained on those kinds of concepts. So we are not claiming that we're training a neural network on Snapdragon, but what we're saying is that a trained network, which then happens to be a very good, or if not the best, classifier for certain kinds of uh, pattern matching tasks, that trained neural network can be deployed to a mobile or embedded SOC like Snapdragon, and then be used uh, to perform classification and do so uh, uh, really, really well. And so in terms of what are we doing to make this possible, so yes, when I do the training, I do that in the cloud, but then that train network, that's still a very large network, and even when that network runs on a device to do classification, there's a lot of computation that's happening as the network is processing the, uh, let's say, images or handwriting or speech. So how do you do that? Well, um, our point of view on this is that machine learning or deep learning networks are a great example of an application of heterogeneous computing. And heterogeneous computing, as I'm sure most of you know, is an extension of parallel compute, but now you're talking about different kinds of cores not just all CPU cores. And Snapdragon is a great example of a heterogeneous system on chip. We have our own hexagon DSP, we have our Adreno GPU, and we have our ARM core CPUs. And so you can think about how do you utilize all of that compute, depending on how much power you can consume, how long you want the computation to take place, and being able to then figure out how to distribute the workload of a neural network onto those different cores of a mobile SOC. And then the last piece of that is you really have to understand, well, what is the type of computation that's happening in a neural network? And as I alluded to when I was describing the demonstration, there are certain kinds of math operations that are very, very common um, and very prevalent in neural nets. So figuring out what is the optimal way and how do you get the most performance. So on top of the heterogeneous compute platform, you have optimized math libraries. And those math libraries and that compute platform are what make it possible to run neural networks on mobile. If I can, if I can jump in a little bit there as well. So, fantastic. 
<laughs> Absolutely fantastic. But not all machine learning needs to involve neural networks, and not all of it needs to go up to the cloud. Um, the part of Qualcomm where I work with is really all about the sensor processing that's happening directly on the chip, um, on the Snapdragon processor, as opposed to taking it up to the cloud. And we use machine learning. Uh, typical smartphones today have anywhere from 10 to 15 different sensors on the phone. And there's a lot of, a lot of things you can do with that much data coming in. So let's just take a single sensor. Right? Let's take a basic accelerometer. They've been in phones for quite a while now. And it's the, the basic sensor that, that'll tell you whether your phone is portrait or landscape when, and switch the screen when you turn it around. It measures linear motion. But just using that one single sensor, we can take data from it with your phone anywhere on your body, whether it's in your pocket, whether it's in your hand, whether it's in your backpack, somewhere attached to you, and tell you how long and how much part of your day um, you have spent walking, running, standing, sitting, driving in a car, or anything else you may have been doing. You can take that same data, you can calculate uh, calorie expenditure, and you can plot out all of this data at the end of the day and see, am I meeting my personal goals for not only how many calories I'm burning, how many steps I'm taking, but how long I'm standing, how long I'm sitting, and anything else you may be doing. And then you can actually modify your behavior to, to adjust. With the exact same data, you can also determine the state of the device itself. So what I was talking about before in activity recognition is determining the state of the user or the person. But determining the state of the device, is my device sitting still on a table? Now, that may seem like pretty benign information, but you can use that information for some very, very useful things. Let's say, for example, it's sitting between two different cellular stations. And when you're between two cell stations, your cell reselection algorithm is going on, and you're ping-ponging between one station and the next. That has a huge impact on power. It also has a huge impact on data throughput. If you can detect that the phone is just sitting there and not moving, you pick a cell station. Stay with it. And then as soon as you detect motion, you can start your cell reselection again. You've saved a lot of power uh, in, in, and expanded your battery life, which is obviously a huge pain point for a lot of smartphone users today. Machine learning is integral to all of that kind of stuff, and it's all done locally on the phone without needing to go up to a neural network. So there's a lot of different places where this type of, uh, this type of stuff can, can happen, and uh, you know, the sensors where I work is, is all very, very local, and all about very low power and staying always on. Background. Right. Yeah, and if, if we extend that, if we extend this uh, concept actually even further, okay, the area that I'm working in, Internet of Things, is really about bringing the compute onto everything else. Right. We talked about the smartphone, but what happens now when it's in the camera, in the door sensor, uh, in the washing machine, okay, in a smart city or wearable? Okay? I mean, we're operating in all of those spheres today, but you think about the smartphone, it's an integrated platform, now we're talking about distributed learning. Okay? Think about all these different devices communicating and creating the learning on a distributed basis. Okay? An example of that is if we think about a, a camera uh, inside the home, it doesn't need to learn everything, it doesn't need to learn landscape on the outside, it really needs to know the family, right? who's coming in and out of the house. So now the training in the patterns become a lot, a lot more limited, but it can now, now it needs to share that information with other devices in the house to make it more, more convenient, more livable, more secure. Okay, so the challenges that we are working on, again, to solve these kind of things is the communication, the interoperability, okay, to provide all that information into the brain. And the brain could be in one of those devices, but it could also be in a smart hub. Okay, another big area of effort that we're working on is a smart gateway. We believe that the gateway is inside the house. We'll start to learn more and more. We'll start to know the people inside, and we'll make things again more convenient for us over time. So I think one thing maybe I should clarify is I was looking at the slide that uh, <laughs> beautiful slide that Margaret had, and I think my colleagues and what they're saying, I think we're all saying the same thing, but we're saying it slightly differently. So if you think about if I've got sensors in the home or lots of different sensors collecting data, and then I can make a decision and I can do something with that. I think of that as action, as in I'm learning to take actions based on the patterns that I'm seeing. When I was talking about you know, learning in terms of happening in the cloud, I'm talking about the features <coughs> and the pattern that I want to learn. So if I need to figure out I'm walking or I'm riding a bike or I'm sitting on a bus, the pattern associated with describing what is being on a bus or walking or riding, that would be what we call offline learning. You would train a classifier to figure that out. But then when it's on your device and you say, well, you're walking, so maybe you want to have your you know, uh, pedometer up or you want to count your number of steps. Absolutely, that you would do on device and that would be the intelligence that you would get 
from uh, having that capability uh, at the edge or um, you know, on an IoT device or on a phone. Um, just a quick clarification, when, when, he's, when Samir's talking about these different layers and these neural nets, he's really talking about kind of like filters. And each one of those filters is detecting a certain thing. And it starts with really broad concepts. It goes down to the very minute concepts. And that depends on the workload. You know, for, an, for a picture, it may be edge detection may be the first one. But by the time it gets down to that bottom layer, it's doing very complex analysis on trying to analyze what that picture really is. So, and some of it's reinforced learning. So sometimes you may be telling you what that image is. Maybe you might be telling you if it's right or wrong. So, I mean, it is a huge process in going through all this learning. Um, one of the questions I have for you guys, because, I mean, this is all great. We're talking about taking this capability of, you know, basically a very high horsepower engine that can actually tell what it's doing or where it's at or its environment, um, and doing always on sensing. So if these sensors are always on, and we're doing this processing, aren't we going to run up against power and memory constraints? Mm -hmm. and Who wants to take that one? I think that's really where they kind of start. Okay. <laughs> <Is that right? laughs> yes, so definitely, because that's the biggest challenge. So I think one thing which, when we think about these problems, I guess we think about more broadly. So I think we definitely think about deep learning and machine learning, but also we think about how we're going to collect all these data 24-7 and what is impact, what is the impact on power. And especially on a smartphone, which is the basically bigger charge than other devices, that's a bigger charge for us. And I guess the two things that we're trying to do is we want to do that in ultra low power, but also want to do that in a, with enough compute horsepower because things are getting complicated. Too. So now you don't have only one sensor, you have multiple sensors, and you want to do more sophisticated <coughs> algorithms on them. So, I, so that's basically a challenge for us. We definitely go back to Samir's point about heterogeneous computing. What would be the perfect engine for that to do, for, for, for it to do? What are the requirements for this sensor processing and how we can adapt that? And that's something that we excel at in doing and I think you can maybe elaborate a little bit more on what we are doing there. Yeah, I, I can certainly elaborate a bit more there. So, so, so I mentioned 10 to 15 sensors sitting on a smartphone today, right? Um, all of those, so, uh, in order to obtain low power and always on functionality, there's a few things that you need to achieve. One is you need to have all the sensors up and running in a low enough power state, which is often defined by the sensor sampling rate. The lower the sampling rate, typically the lower the power. So you want to have as low possible sampling rate as possible that can still have good enough resolution to be able to discern whatever it is you want to discern, whether it was the activity recognition example I gave earlier or anything else. Secondly, you need to find a way in order to process the data in a very low power way. Typically, the, the main application processor, CPU sitting on an, on an SOC like Snapdragon, tends to be a fairly high power system, and you cannot have it on all the time, otherwise it will drain your battery very, very quickly. You also want to take other high power portions of the phone, the display being a key example, and keep them in their lowest power state possible, which is obviously off. right? So you need to have a separate processing subsystem specifically for the sensors, have the sensors connected into it directly, and have that be able to talk to all the other processing systems on the SOC without necessarily turning them on. So let me give a different example. Let's say it's a navigation, right? Navigation, we're inside a building right now. We can't use GPS. My phone can't see the satellite, right? But I can use sensors to determine or make that blue dot move to the right place on the map. If I walk forward 50 feet, rotate 30 degrees and walk forward 50 feet, my sensors can detect that, right? So um, I need to keep those on. I need to process it on a separate subsystem. Then I need to be able to send that to the location technology IP, wherever that happens to be sitting on the SOC. In the case of Qualcomm, that's actually sitting on a different subsystem from the sensor subsystem. So we'll pre-process the sensor data and send it there. Another good example is uh, camera. Uh, image stabilization. If I want to remove hand jitter in my phone, I can actually detect the hand jitter using the sensors on the phone. I pre-process that data from the sensors on the sensor subsystem, then send it to the camera subsystem, which can then modify the, the, the display or back screen as, as appropriate. But the key secrets are having a separate low power processor for sensors and keeping the sensors in their lowest possible sampling rate um, to, to get whatever level of data you need. And I think there is also one other constraint here is basically cost. 
Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, you mentioned it's a separated, basically, uh, piece, but it's actually everything is, it, our approach is to, yes. to integrate everything in the SOC, so we don't use external sensor hub, because exactly, that's basically right. add cost. So how to do that in an integrated way, in a very low power, and then also have enough processing horsepower to basically handle this use cases. And that's the challenge which actually we have lots of innovation there to do right. That's exactly right. And processor choice is important, right? A lot of external sensor hubs are using MCUs. Now MCUs are great for relatively low requirements in processing, but as the use cases become more complex and you get more concurrent use cases, more sensor processing needs to be done at one time, things like a DSP can start to be much, much more efficient. So Qualcomm excels in DSP technologies. We integrate them directly into our SOCs and we dedicate them to sensor processing. All right, then the complementary side for the distributed system of that, right, is if we're building, for example, something for a camera, we can now have the communication infrastructure we built, you know, based on like all joint and all same technology, we can communicate and, and say, this is a small device, right, trying to connect with a, with a larger device. So if that device is small and operating on the battery, it can actually do only the processing that can be required for that specific area okay, and, and offload all the other stuff to the bigger device. Okay, if that's a smartphone or that's an or, a, or a large gateway. Okay, and that is a way for us also to do the balance in terms of the power management of things. Okay, making sure we only use as much as we need and we offload the rest of the stuff where we see the network becoming stronger and more connected to the power. And we're actually seeing these distributed systems that he's referring to even outside of IoT. Let's take, for example, smartwatches to phones to smart glasses, to sensors that'll start to be embedded in clothes, right? All of those need a central hub to process a lot of the data. They could each have their own individual central hub, but that just adds cost and probably has a lot of overlap. So having a good, a good processor that can operate at low power within the phone, which tends to be the central hub for all of these things, has huge, huge value in being able to solve these kinds of problems. I think that's a fair point. I think two of the biggest misconceptions we have uh, about IoT or IOE is the fact that some people say everything's going to go to the cloud. We can't. We don't have that much bandwidth. And you have to do real-time processing a lot of times. And the other one is that everything's going to be an intelligent device. A lot of times it's not. It's just going to be a sensor. It's just going to be detecting information for you. So I know you guys have a lot of questions. So let's go ahead and get on. The first one we have right over here in the front row, and then we'll kind of go on down and through. Thank you guys for the detailed explanation, too. Great. Uh, thank you for excellent presentations and explanations. I want to kind of take a broader look at things because all the pictures that you've shown, basically, a I, I don't have a technical background, so uh, so all the pictures that you've shown, really, basically, a four-year-old would be able to recognize at this point, and they could recognize with 100% accuracy, and you'd have some errors in there. So, what is it? Going back to the kind of the topic of this discussion, who says that machines can't think like humans? So what is it about the human brain that allows them to learn these things with much higher accuracy and everything? And now we're just talking about picture recognition. And if you get into things like medicine, where everyone's talking about, oh, computers will help diagnose you know, diseases and stuff, and physician can tell you right away that, okay, a patient has heartburn, not a heart attack. And we're so, still so far away from that. So what is it about the human brain that that the computers cannot do at this point. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I, I want to say one thing real quick. Um, by the way, on the medical, Qualcomm is actually sponsoring an XPRIZE to develop a tricorder, kind of the Star Trek thing, to diagnose patients. So that, that effort is actually ongoing right now. But I, I, wouldn't, want, I wouldn't want to be... I mean, I have chest pain. I, you know, you know, I, I, I asked him what my doctor did. <laughs> and, 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 and I agree, but yeah. you can have a doctor anywhere in the world, and you can have those images or that information scan across databases with billions of pre-done diagnosis to compare it to. No, by, by the way, I think that's the, wrong, that's the wrong thing, because what if you would know a day in advance that you're going to get a heart attack? So yeah. that's the question you ask. Right, and that's the kind of stuff that you can know machines can do for you. Right, if you start to collect the information, your weight is going up, you've eaten certain things, you've done certain exercise, they can do prediction, they can compare it to your age group, right, to different things. So this is where it's heading. So not, not necessarily replace what they're doing, but actually maybe give a heads up that there's an 80% chance that this may happen. 
Of course. It, it, I mean, we're working on predictive like maintenance for tool. washing machines. We want to be doing the same stuff for people, right? So guys, let me turn that around. You know, his question, what can the human brain, rather than what can the human brain do that the computers can, what does it take to get the computers to be able to match or exceed what the human can do? So I think, think about what a computer excels at and what you excel at. A computer is going to be better at balancing your checkbook than almost any of us will ever be. <laughs> Why is that? Because at the fundamental of any modern computer, there's four operations. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. And you can take long or short or multiple combinations of that, but every algorithm can be broken down to that, those four we fundamental can. tasks. So we don't believe when we think about our brains that our brains are always either adding, subtracting, dividing, or multiplying. There are things we don't yet know about how the brain works. And especially when you get past perceptual pattern matching. So perception is an area where, because the visual part of the brain has been studied in such detail, that when you look at like deep learning and you look at the human brain and how the visual system works, there is some loose you know, inspiration that deep learning is taking from the brain. But when you get past perception mat uh, pattern matching, you start thinking about concept understanding. You start thinking about reasoning about concepts. Uh, being able to uh, deal with uncertainty. So as human beings, even as a four-year-old, you know, if, I, if a four-year-old has seen a lion once, he probably doesn't need to see a lion a you know, hundred times or a thousand times to know that it's a lion. And especially the lion was chasing him when he first saw him, <laughs> right? So there are things the human brain excels at that neuroscience is still working on trying to figure out what is exactly going on there. But we don't have all the answers. Where we do have answers, we're able to say, well, how much of this could we replicate in computation and therefore solve tasks? But there is a long way to go. If you look at Magid's chart again, you know, perception. That's what deep learning is all the rage. But then you think about reasoning and action, the jury's still out on what are the best approaches for that. So, so one comment I'll add to that, though, is, I mean, the humans, we say we're limited to five senses, right? But the machines can actually go beyond. Right now, a machine can tell me what the level of carbon dioxide is in this room, but I can't necessarily sense it while sitting up here, right? So machines do have a bit of an advantage that they can actually get more information very, very quickly than any human can get. It's really figuring out what to do with it that's the secret, <laughs> right? And that's, that's where humans really have, have strong advantages. And I actually would argue that we don't want actually machines to do exactly the things that we right. do. Because if we do that, it's, it doesn't add any value. But as Samir mentioned, actually machines have been for a very long time excelling at specific tasks and actually beating human. I guess what we would like to do is to find actually what machines are strong at and leverage that and add that to our human ability. And that's the idea about this expanding what we can do basically. Okay. Next question, Ray, your first. Uh, my question, I'm a big fan of this work as well. Is the mic on? Hello? There you go. Okay. Uh, and just because yesterday I was reading an article by Elon Musk that uh, by 2025, driving will become very dangerous for human beings. <laughs> so it has to be driverless cars. Now, of course, Elon Musk is a great guy, but he's a marketer. I'm an engineer. I want to know from a technological point of view what you guys think. Number one, is that really real? Is that possible? Or is this lot of marketing hoo ha? Yeah, so I think. I will say from a technology standpoint, I wouldn't even wait till 2025. I think it's going to be possible well ahead of that. I mean, if you hear what major automakers tell you, uh, you hear over and over again 90% autonomy by 2020. Now, the technology is only a piece of it. You've got regulation, you've got societal implications around you know, uh, driverless cars, and I forget who, who was it. I think it was I, I, someone I recently heard. The ultimate test of a driverless car is when I can legally take a bottle of Jack Daniels, get in the car, and the car will take me to point A to point B. And Don't use that example. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think there are there are other implications for you know, will it be real? Will it be deployed? Will we all be able to use it? But from a technology standpoint, you know the pieces are coming together very very rapidly. So um, machine, you're saying machine learning, machine learning is already or going to be very close to that. Yes. But the regulations and the security and all of those things may come in. That's right. And user acceptance, right? That's, I, that's really the thing, right? Are you feeling comfortable sitting in one of those? As an analyst, I'm going to be the dissenter here. 
Um, I think it's going to be in stages. I think we'll see commercial first and dedicated lanes and stuff like that. I think because of those regulations and issues, you're probably not going to see it until 2030. Um, so I, I think he's a little overall optimistic, but this is a guy that's selling cars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and again, we <laughs> Next question. Just continue this broader dialogue. Uh, microphone, please. Yeah. Yeah, I'm giving it off to everyone because I don't want anybody to make that. So just press it on before you speak. So, so let's just continue this broader question, because that is really what I think most of us are thinking, which is, if you are all technologists and you are predicting the future, there are certain things that are going to happen sooner than later, right? So, you know, the concept of exponential growth, exponential technologies, what will be happening, and much of this happens because in some areas, many, many companies get involved. Qualcomm is one of one of those companies. If there are 10 of you around the world that are trying to solve similar problems, things happen much faster. And that's why XPRIZE and those kinds of things really make a difference. So can you just look next 10 years, not even 20? What is it, what is it that we should see using that you feel will really make a difference in human life? So, so we've been talking a little bit about some of this today, but to know where we're going, I think first we should take a little bit of a stock in, in where we are, right? If you take a look at where we are with at least my part of the, the, the mobile world, the sensors world, right? It's really about data collection, right? Um, you can buy a phone today, you can buy a smartwatch today, it can tell you your heart rate. That's all it tells you. It gives you a number. Apple will soon be able to allow you to share that with your loved ones, right? Great for everybody. But really, that's just information. Now, when you take that information and you take it to a trend, then you can start to, to figure some things out. You get enough data to create a trend. From that trend, you can get to diagnosis. From a diagnosis, you can get to treatment. From treatment, you can even track the adherence to the treatment. From the adherence to the treatment, you can start to track improvements and perhaps even adjust the diagnosis or adjust the treatment, right? Today, we're just at data. We're not anywhere else along that path that I just described. And that's just a simple example in the healthcare field using a single metric. And if you look at future metrics that are coming in healthcare, when you start taking that heart rate data, you start mixing it with blood pressure, you start mixing it with blood oxygen, you start mixing it with galvanic skin response, and so many other biosensors that are going to be coming into mobile devices that you're probably going to buy in the next 10 years. You can just imagine where it can take you. Now, there are regulatory issues and all the rest of that. Sorry? Yes, exactly. Now, there are regulatory issues and all the rest of that that need to get resolved for all of this to become a reality. But that, I expect, will also start to get sorted out. But we're very, very, very much at the very beginning of what I perceive to be a huge revolution. You start taking then that bio data and you start taking environmental data from the environmental sensors that tell you your CO, CO2, your oxygen level. You know, people, people talk to me about using, using uh, environmental sensors in Beijing. My mind is, if I can't see the building next to me, I don't need a sensor to tell me that the air is bad, right? It's in a room like this where I want to know that it's bad and do I need to change my filter? Or is there some other action I can take to adjust it because it's consistently bad? That's where the differences will really start to take place. And then you can even track the impact of those differences. But today, we're just at data. We're nowhere else along that path. And that's just the very, very first step. If I, can, if I can add to that, so if you think about your uh, question and then I think you said, well, what if you had a machine that could look at your MRI or your fMRI? So let's just take that example. If you could train a machine to look at millions of examples of fMRI images and it figured out, it could learn little differences and subtle differences, it could aid a physician or a radiologist in finding things based on the fact that it's seen billions of examples of an fMRI but a radiologist has maybe seen a few hundred or thousands of examples either in medical school or their practice. Now you combine the reasoning and intelligence capability of a human doctor along with the machine's capability of looking at the trends and patterns in the data, then all of a sudden that's a whole new level of care or preventative care or diagnostics uh, that we think we'll be able to get access to uh, in the next few years. Well, and I, I think Ron would agree with this. This isn't just about how it impacts the consumer, but everything around us. Uh, 
these intelligent machines are going to be able to help us do scientific research, uh, improve designs, you know, uh, increase manufacturing. I mean, there's just about every aspect of our life. If we can take that data, the more data we have, the better we can do just about anything. This is a tool like any other tool we've had in our lifetime. It's just really applied to just about everything we can think about. Well, yeah, I, uh, I have a couple of quick comments, maybe just to add to the discussion. Uh, this was actually relating to the question that was asked, you know, a four-year-old can identify these images. So why, why, you know, why are computers only here? And, uh, you know, I have some background in, in this area, so I, I, I just share my two cents. Uh, you know, the human brain, you can think of it very conceptually and very simply. I'm not giving you a lot of technical jargon, but there's an old brain and a new brain. You know, the new brain is the prefrontal cortex that allows you to think. But the old brain, you know, had, uh, nature has spent millions and millions of years uh, through evolution trying to get that right. And, and the types of stuff it does uh, is actually uh, very, very, very compute intensive. Uh, you know, things uh, like sensory motor skills and uh, uh, evaluating someone's emotional uh, response, understanding that at a, you know, at a glance. Uh, all of that, uh, all of those tasks are, are really very hard for computers uh, to uh, figure out. Computers have been very good at doing what the new brain can do, any kind of compute, uh, you know, specific stuff, analysis. Uh, and, you know, the new brain has been around for a much shorter period of time than the old brain. And, and computers have figured the new brain piece out, and now the computers are trying to figure out what the old brain does. In fact, this is called uh, Morosev's paradox where, you know, picking up even a pencil from the floor is actually quite hard for a computer or on a table. You know, for a human, you use the table as, like, you put your hand on the table as a, uh, you know, a feedback loop that, uh, you know, the table surface is here and you go to the pencil, the computer will go exactly on top of the pencil, pick the pencil up. Uh, so those things are, are harder uh, in general to do. Uh, and and uh, just on a lighter note, we're talking about cars. Um, uh, the, some of the discussion now has shifted uh, from, uh, not whether the cars will become automatic, but uh, when do we ban human uh, drivers? You know, that's the new discussion is, uh, you know, it's too uh, dangerous to have humans around at a certain point in time later. And, and when will that point come? I, I have five hot rods, so I don't ever want to see that day coming. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> my question relates to, you know, you've, you've made a case that computers are getting very good at thinking. Okay. And you, you know, with the multiple sensor access to things, you're going to give them more control. Okay. Have you worried about what kind of problems might arise, and what work is being done you know, to prevent from disasters, you know, from happening? I'd like to hear about that. So I, I, I love this question because it, even Elon Musk and uh, um, Stephen, Hawking. Stephen Hawking have made comments that I've had to kind of go after. So, but I, I want our panel to really address this. So I think there's there's two camps. So there's the Elon Musk's and the uh, Stephen Hawking, and uh, maybe even Bill Gates that fall into the category. But we have to distinguish the kind of AI they're talking about versus when you hear machine learning researchers like Andrew Ang or Jeffrey Hinton, or Jan McCoon, and what their point of view on this is. So the worry is this notion of artificial general intelligence. And we are a long way from the, art from the ability to say we have artificial general intelligence. The kinds of problems we're solving today, these pattern matching tasks, and maybe some level of reasoning or inference on top of that, that's what we call artificial narrow intelligence. And so it's certain domains, certain kinds of problems, data driven, um, I, I am less concerned about the ethical implications of artificial narrow intelligence, and I'm not going to hold my breath for when we're going to have artificial general intelligence, but you're absolutely right that if and when that comes about, there are ethical yeah, things we have to think about. Actually, I think... Okay, I'll speak loud. You know, as soon as you know, say, oh, for your convenience, the, the coffee pot will stop. You know, uh, 15 minutes before, you know, you're going to wake up, okay? And different things, you know, around the house are convenience things, okay? Now, there is a difference. All the things you showed me are wonderful because it's an input to me, okay? And the control is totally in 
my hands and it is enhancing you know my ability or person's ability the moment this convenience goes to where things can be turned on okay things can actually go back or you know and this is uh, the machine may be thinking it is doing something something else is happening okay and that's how fires start and, you know one can easily imagine scenarios the moment okay you know locks can be opened you know things can be turned on okay and uh, the air conditioning is already being controlled okay so let me, let me so ask you that is, my, my question is okay are you worrying about it and how are you worrying about it and yeah. you know how are you going about it i mean i'm, so I'm not asking let me, solutions let me ask a related question to this yeah. all of us take commercial airliners every day right I'm sure, or not every day. I'm sorry, that's just me. Uh, our, our, we, we've flown on commercial airliners. We trust the pilots in the cockpit with our lives. But guess who the pilots are trusting all of our lives with? Autopilot. Autopilot. And guess what the regulations say? That in certain weather conditions, the autopilot has to fly the plane and land the airplane. And so we are already putting our lives in the hands of machines because in many, many circumstances throughout, you know, history, it's been shown that a machine will not make the kinds of mistakes that a human being will. And so we are willing to entrust machines with safety critical things. But it's certainly possible that you know my you know, coffee pot could go off at the wrong time, or somebody could hijack the lock and open it. But I don't understand. It, it is, if the thing behavior remains in the domain of what was modeled, OK? then you're safe, okay? But in an open situation like home, okay, right? There are other things that can happen, and I can conjecture, okay? Uh, more than two things start, overload occurs, okay? Some way the wiring is poor, which is not controlled by the computer, okay? I have, I have seen, if you study how the accidents occur, okay? It is. It was not intended. Yeah, it was coincidental. And, okay. And it is collab Something happened which was so the mapping of all situations, strange things that might arise. Okay, is a very difficult task. I actually, I, I would argue against that. And let me tell you why. Especially for the examples these guys have given, because the more intelligence you have throughout that network, like in a home, you're not going to have the coffee pot operating independently. You're going to have sensors throughout the home that are doing different things, monitoring different things. And you're going, to, you're, you're going to have different sensory inputs all feeding into maybe a central intelligence or multiple intelligence points that are going to be detecting all this. So yeah, maybe my, uh, maybe my coffee pot does go haywire and catches fire. Well, guess what? I probably have uh, CO2 and fire and smoke detectors in there that are already de de detecting that there's a heat source or something wrong or there's a surge in the current of my power. So I mean, the more we create these, the, put more of these sensors out there to actually sense this stuff, the better off we are because we can do more than that. Yeah, and the second thing is prevention. Okay, we just talked about what happens when there, you know, how to get to an accident and then what happens. But the other thing we're building into those smart gateways is also putting things in different domains, right? So things that are, that are critical, like safety, like opening the door, opening the garage door, they're not gonna be in the same thing as the coffee machine. Okay, we will know how to segregate them. We won't let algorithms cross over. And the same thing is happening with security, right? A very big concern is security. Now that I have everything connected, people can hack into my door. They can open my garage, right? We don't want that stuff happening. But with a smart gateway that it will have a, a learning algorithm, all of those pieces, we can now detect anomalies. It's not a question whether things will get hacked. It's a question of, you know, it, we're sure it's going to happen, right? But we'll be able to find, find out and, and avert it in advance. That's really the idea. Okay, I'm being told I need to take this question next. So, and then you. So, I. Uh, so, yes, go ahead. Okay. So, my question is that you have taken up two use cases. One is for the home security, and another for the sensors for the help. So, how these two sensors for Qualcomm are different from the Apple? Because Apple is already giving the health kit and the home kit. So how about these, uh, your solutions are different from those? Good question. 
Okay. Yay. <laughs> okay. First, actually, we, um, I think we see this whole entire ecosystem building together is, is really, really important. Okay. Actually, we are working with everyone. Okay. So it's not contradictory. Okay. The common stuff that we do is enablers. Okay. Think about this, the health kit. What they've done is they created the pipes for the information to come in, but they don't really deal with the sensor itself, how it's processed, how much power it's consuming. Okay. They're really dealing more with the communication layer and the building some infrastructure. And in addition to that, we don't think there's going to be just one ecosystem. There's going to be multiple ecosystems getting built in the market. Because some of those applications are not going to be just around the consumer, okay, around the iPhone. There's things around the industrial, smart cities, okay, all of those pieces yeah, that are out there. So what we're really spending our time on is creating the enablers for those, right? The semiconductor that's optimized to run those algorithms, right? And specific use cases that can make it happen. Now it will run better on our solution, right? But it will interoperate and it will work with HomeKit and they will benefit as well. So let's 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 just take an example. So you, you keep you keep bringing up Apple and how it's vertically integrating, and I think that's a great example, right? But fundamentally, Apple's not the only company that's doing that, and they're not the only company that's trying to do that, right? And the reality is that in order to enable all of these companies to be successful, because fundamentally, having a vibrant, competitive environment is actually good to be able to a test out what the right services are and get them to market, right? Different companies may focus on different things and B, to continually improve the services, because one guy always wants to be his competitor, right? But to enable that, you need to have core underlying technologies that all of these guys can end up using. Qualcomm is a good provider of those technologies. We have competitors as well, right? And that's okay, in my mind. In fact, that is good for the, for, for the market. The other was, it wouldn't be an interesting you, market to be in. Sorry? Who are Qualcomm's competitors? Yes. Who do you think uh, your are top five competitors? Well, I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Qualcomm's a very broad company, so it depends on the space, right? If you look in, in, in the mobile cell phone world, um, Qualcomm does very well in the premium tier. Apple does very well in the premium tier. In the lower tiers, Apple's not uh, as present, but you see companies like Qualcomm and MediaTek competing against each other, right? Um, you look outside of the mobile space, and we have many competitors in many different areas. And I think it's important to remember that Apple doesn't make everything in the phone. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 yeah, and the they're not going to be doing all the software. They're not going to be doing all the databases. They're not going to be doing all the cloud services. It, is, it has to be a rich ecosystem for any of this stuff to actually be effective. Yeah, in, in, in fact, yeah. in our gateway today, we are creating mixed environment that people can connect HomeKit networks with other networks. Yeah, actually, the use case, what I'm thinking because of the example, like uh, how the stuff we can leverage with the Apple along with the Qualcomm, like the use cases you are mentioned, if we are going for the another another hardware to be get developed, uh, which parallelly with the uh, Apple is doing, so what extra benefits as a development or as a developer side could be beneficial to take over from Apple if we are taking up the use case to do any of these stuffs? So, so Apple Apple is a is a great company. There's no doubt about it. But if you look at it, there's more smartphones in the world that are not Apple than are Apple, right? So if you really want to enable the entire market, you need to look beyond just Apple. And that's just the reality of it. Okay. I have a uh, hold on. about competition. You know, this is about the subject. Yeah, but oh, yes. we, we, we got to get everybody's yeah. questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, Since we are <coughs> comparing the machine with the human brain, let me bring you to a reality. The human brain has 100 billion neurons. And each neuron is equivalent to 10 transistors. So you are looking at a brain which is equivalent to one trillion transistors. The best we have achieved so far is about integrated about 15 million transistors on a single chip, and that uses 200 watts of power. Now move over to the brain. One trillion transistors use 20 watts of power. Our brain uses 20 watts of power. Let's move on to another area. Our architecture today is all Boolean algebra. We have been on that path for hundreds of years. You're looking at a brain where the 100 billion neurons connect and disconnect and do the parallel processing. So some of the things that you have just quoted, they are very well-defined, small examples of defined tasks. If you think 
think the mic's off. Yeah. If you think that we are about to beat the brain or even match the brain, we got a long way to go. Brain has evolved over billions of years, and you're looking at a machine that we are barely with a 15 billion transistors, and we are trying to teach it. So, you have any comment about that? Yes. That we're, and let me also. And yes. let me. Yes. Let me also. <laughs> By the way, the fact that you just. The, what you just Pushing. defined, yeah. the airplane uh, landing yeah. with the control being handed to tower, yeah. when it comes to that's a well defined, well matched, with an environmentally all defined task, that's why you give the con uh, control of the plane to the tower. When it comes to, uh, uh, there are cases where the, the pilot is asked to take control because the tower has failed. So there is a lot, we have got a long way to go guys. So I think, first of all, you're absolutely right. We do have a long way to go. Um, as I said earlier, there's parts of the brain we don't understand how they work. And to parse the rest of your question, you take 100 billion neurons and then you have a few trillion uh, connections between those neurons. And what are they all doing? Do we know the answer to that? Absolutely not. And the other question, which is, if you think about power consumption, you're absolutely right. If you think about we can keep miniaturizing transistors, but we know we're going to run into physics limits, and we're not going to be able to do that forever. So we have to think about new kinds of architecture. We have to look at non-von Neumann architectures where memory and compute are co-located the way they are in the human brain. We have to think about fundamentally lower power architectures. If you think about what the neurons in your brain are doing, they're doing something called spiking. They're called spiking neural nets. And Qualcomm actually did research in what's called neuromorphic architectures which is you try to emulate biology in silicon, and you can then hopefully show that you can do lots of computation, but at a much lower power budget than a traditional silicon-based, transistor-based computer would. But the challenge with all of that is right back to the original question. We don't know everything about how the brain does computation. Does it even do computation in the way that we think about computation? It's probably not doing Boolean logic, for example. It's probably something else going on. So we're hoping, whether it's neuroscience, new math, that we will learn more about the brain. And it will always be an approximation. We will approximate different brain function, whether it's biology, whether it's the algorithm, whether it's the, you know, how, how does the brain wire itself up? How do those 100 billion neurons wire themselves up and it starts to learn? What's the learning algorithm of the brain? These are all great questions, and I would, I would say that these are open questions, and I think there should be no claim that when we say cognitive, we mean it at the level of a human brain. But what we're saying is, if you think again, to certain parts of the brain, certain subsystems of the brain, we have learned enough to say there are things that we can try to replicate and get small benefits, like perception pattern matching when looking at a camera or looking at or listening to speech or looking at language. And it's actually quite surprising how well these systems are able to do in either matching human performance and in some cases exceeding it, but it's not the whole picture. It's not the whole, everything that the brain does. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody in this panel would say that we're trying to replace the human brain. But, but, but yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure we should, okay? I think it's a fair question, but the question is whether, I mean, is, is that economically interesting? Is there enough value there? Right, if you think about this, the kind of problem we're trying to solve is convenience, right, inside the smart home and efficiency. Safety. And there's so much of the safety, there's so much that can be done, right? There's so much value that can be there. If you optimize for a specific application, and computers are fantastic there, right? So if we go all the way to really replacing the brain, yeah, we're going to get some stuff, but there's so much stuff on the way, right, that we can do. I honestly think, think what's happening... You're coming one percent close to what yeah. the human brain can do to what the, what the machines can do. But, but, I mean, it depends, once again, on what you're talking about. If you want to calculate pi to the one millionth decimal point, I'd rather depend on a machine than the human brain, right? So, so, so it really does depend on what it is you're trying to accomplish, because machines are very good at certain things and certainly better than humans in those areas, right? Yeah, but that's not thinking. So, well, it's, it's computing, right? And uh, he wasn't talking about computing. He was talking about thinking. Right. But, yeah. So I think we all agree. I guess as thinking, we we can't replicate that in the machine. We can't get to the cognition level <coughs> of human being in a machine. I think what's happening just these machines are dedicated for a specific task that they do very well. That people get really impressed with what with what the machine can do, 
but they don't think about the bigger picture. It's again like the machines are really good at specific tasks, but they cannot do the bigger cognition or thinking. I guess we are not disagreeing with that. So one of the uh, one of the reasons you mentioned to bring you know this architecture is, uh, or one of the goal, one of the goals it achieves is being able to do perception and all of these things on the chip itself without sending any data to the cloud. And privacy is one of the main drivers for this particular thing. Now, if you take one of the learning technologies such as deep learning, uh, deep neural network networks, it requires a lot of data to train. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile this two? Because if you're trying to keep things private, we don't have the training data yep, anymore. Yep. Yeah, so I, I, it's, a, it's a very good question, which is deep learning is data driven, but we're talking about deep neural nets running on chip or on device. So the subtlety to this is that a trained deep, deep network is also a very good classifier. So we are using the classifier piece of the neural network that's running on device. But of course, if I want to train that neural net, I need lots and lots of data. There, are, there is evidence and there are techniques to saying, well, maybe I want to customize it a little bit or I want to personalize it a little bit. For example, a deep neural network can be taught to do face recognition and you can show it millions of examples of human faces and it understands what a face is. But then when you put it out in the wild and you show it a face it's never seen before, it's not magically going to identify who that person is. But there are ways to do things like show it two or three examples of that face you wanted to recognize and that can be done on chip, on device and it will then learn to recognize that face. That's actually one of the other things we've actually built is to show that you can do this on device without having to retrain the entire neural network. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, how many more questions? I think we have time yeah. for only one or one two. One more. I apologize. Due to time, we're going to. I wanted to ask about the cloud versus the IoT devices, and the question is related to, uh, you know, has like vision where there's a centralized computer with deep learning through neural networks, etc. That IBM Watson has demonstrated. So what is the vision going forward in terms of an IoT married with the cloud? Is it going to be a hell like uh, you know IBM Watson, which makes all the decisions? Uh, where do things go from here in that regard? We know that there's going to be localized intelligence, as you have amply demonstrated, uh, with sensors, you know, minimal or, or very rich uh, localized intelligence. And uh, neural networks can be replicated with the uh, cloud-based IBM Watson. Through VPNs, you can open up several things into the IBM Watson and get your analysis done uh, without having security violations. So you solve a lot of simultaneous problems this way uh, of security, uh, VPNs, uh, privacy, all of these things can be solved if there's a grand vision like that. So I'm just wanting to see what your grand vision of a cloud uh, married with IoT is. You know, where does it go? How does it evolve? Good question. I think our reality is that Watson is a fantastic platform, extremely smart, but we don't think that everything is going to go to the cloud. Okay? And the main reason is because of scale. Okay? There's, so first of all, you've got the communication bottleneck. Okay? That's the reality today. That's the kind of things that we're working to solve, right? making sure that actually bits can go from point A to point B. So not everything is going to go up to the cloud. It can't. I mean, the amount of information we perceive, we can't just go shut it up. And the second thing, there has to be a balance as well. Things around privacy. Right? We talked about that earlier. We touched about it. You know, if you're building something just for your house, you don't want all the information going out. Okay, you just don't, right? You want to get it close. So we believe that at the end of the day, the compute and the and the, um, and the learning piece and all of that will be happening at the lowest point at the edge that it could. Okay, that's really that's really what we're thinking. All of that needs to shove down. Right? So we're taking things from the cloud down to the smartphone, down to the access point. Okay, down to the down to the end unit itself. Now the end unit itself may not be as smart to do everything, right? And here is the question of the balance. But that creates a scale. Even for Watson itself, over time, it's probably going to rely on these multiple networks, right? Think about the fog, more of a fog model, right, than a, than a cloud driving everything on its own. Well, I apologize. We're kind of at the end here. This is a great discussion. But I want to encourage you to come up and ask these guys questions. I want to thank again KPNV and, um, and uh, panelists.